Um, so, so welcome. Um, this birds and brews thing started some years ago with the Southwest New Mexico Audubon Society, and it was pre-COVID times, and we used to all meet at the Little Toad Brewery, and we'd have beverages of our choice, and some would eat, and it's, it's kind of an informal thing. So when COVID came along, um, Audubon and and we do some shared programs with Audubon, the Healing Native Plant Society. And um, so this is, this is the online version of Birds and Brews. So if you want some water, some tea, some coffee, a beer, some wine, now's the time to get it. We have, um, I have a list of upcoming events. Um, the Audubon Society is going to have a field trip to Lake Roberts, and we're really going to be focusing on waterfowl. Certainly there could be eagles and osprey as well. And it's a great event. It's on um, Saturday, January 29th. And we encourage you to come to bring friends. Um, it's a family welcome <laughs> um, opportunity. And um, we, I want all of those of you birders out there with some experience to be there to help us with hopefully all the folks that come that are new to birding or, or are not either amateur birders. They're really important for us. So um, anyway, so that's happening on January 29th. And then the Audubon Society also has a program in February. Um, as far as the Healing Native Plant Society, we're looking at the fabulous flora of the City of Rock State Park, and we've got our cadre of botanists lined up for Friday, January. Oh, I'm sorry, 21st. The 21st is the the uh, the talk, right. but our cadre of botanists is ready on Saturday, the 22nd, the day after, for a field trip at um, City of Rock State Park. And that is going to be in conjunction with the Friends of City of Rocks. Um, the City of Rocks State Park is a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful area. Um, in February on the 18th, Donna Stevens is going to do Spring Blooms in the Southwest. Um, Donna was going to do that live a couple years ago and COVID thwarted that. <laughs> so she's going to be back this time on Zoom. Um, Ron Perry, who is in the audience tonight, uh, Maws of the Gila, this is an update, revised, renewed, and um, I'm sure he'll have some interesting insights um, after today's talk. Um, and then something that the Gila Native Plant Society is extremely excited to be a part of is the Ninth Natural History of the Gila Symposium. And um, so we are a major sponsor of that event. So you'll find out, um, be looking for more information on that. Ready to transition, Wendy. Okay, so. Um, here. Well, for some reason, it's not there. I know. There we go. Let me share. Okay. So, Wendy is uh, as always our techie and so much more okay and then we're going to do slideshow okay so hopefully you're you're all seeing this um, we're going to ask you to ask questions or make comments in the chat room and then when the program is over um, we'll we'll draw some questions and then if things are going well um, we may open it up for um, some live questions from you so i would suggest that you hold on brace yourselves we have photography of Elroy Limmer and Elroy has an eye like no one else I have ever known 
But what he really does is he zeroes in on, on things that we miss. And he zeroes in on the biodiversity, insects that you have never seen before, but they are in your yard all summer and fall, spring long. And he has an eye for that. You know, Thomas Lovejoy just passed away and he was the, the fellow who, who came up with this idea of biodiversity, at least he named it. And, you know, this incredible diversity of living organisms we have on this earth. Um, we also um, lost the Ant-Man, E.L. Wilson. E. Wilson this year. And he really took that idea of biodiversity and, um, you know, took it to another level. Not just, he's not just the ant man. He was the person that was really, really pushing and hoping that we could get our hands around the fact that we have a wonderful diversity of life on earth and we need to preserve it. So as I said, hang on and um, it's going to move quickly. The first thing we would like to do is introduce the pollinators. Who are they? We'll start with the flies. I know, you're everyone's favorite. Yeah, these are only going to stay up there a very short period of time, about uh, seven seconds apiece. This is a bee fly. Uh, many people would think it's a bee, but it's a fly. A lot of these are a little difficult if you're not accustomed to looking at such things, that you wouldn't realize they're, they're flies and not bees or wasps. And so we're going to move through these quickly and name a few of them. Uh, so Elroy, for those of us that are not that uh, knowledgeable about flies, what what makes a fly a fly? What what kinds of characteristics will we see in these oh, photos? Yes. Well, it's, their wing patterns are are different than bees, and uh, they they just have a different look about them. And they're and uh, so I it's I'm not able to tell you that right off the top of my head. How yeah, if you yeah, look at the, you think but, about go ahead go ahead. Well, they're they're a little different. Uh, their their heads and thorax look different. Have than, than bees or wasps, but sometimes they can fool you too. And uh, I've been fooled before many times, but those are all bees or flies that we're looking at. And yeah, the, the, the flies have two wings. Right. And the rest of the insects that we're looking at have four wings. I um, mean, you might not see that. The antennae are a little bit different. The eyes are a little different. Sometimes it, it looks like they've got sunglasses on. And their tongues are entirely different than others. Uh, most of them are. There's, of course, there's so many different species of all of these different insects that you you can't always say that this is the gospel because there's a lot of variety. Yes, and we're not entomologists, no. so <laughs> we're not insect experts. But I mean, we have some in the house, but um, but look at this one. I think that's the eyeglass fly there but see how those those compound eyes meet in the middle and that's not always the way it is but but oftentimes but they they do as Elroy said they have a look about them yeah. all of these photographs that you will see tonight were taken locally these are not exotic from other countries these are things that you can see in your backyard yeah. or at the Silver Creek Botanical Garden right. so many of these were taken at the Botanical Garden these the canid flies were taken there, which are so, on the Chamisa in the fall. What are they feeding on, Elroy? Well, um, generally, in the fall, a lot of them feed on the Chamisa, but they feed on all the different flowers. And you'll see some uh, uh, repetition of plant material, and a lot of them are taken in my own backyard. And I raised Gallardia for the main reason just because it's easy to, uh, well, many insects feed on. Uh, there's, you know, different, different wasps. Uh, wasps get a bad name uh, as being aggressive and all of that. And sure, there are uh, a few that 
are that way, but most of these are solitary wasps and they're not aggressive towards humans. And so if you see them, I mean, I walk right up to them. I haven't been stung in years. They have a wasp waist. The wa them. Yeah, the wasp waist. <laughs> and look at that very, very thin little connection between the head, thorax, and the yeah. abdomen. Yeah. So just because they feed on and pollinate plants, uh, some many of them are, are predatory to other insects, including bees. And uh, that's just the way the world is. There's a lot of a lot of insects that uh, prey upon a lot of wasps that prey on just about every insect out there. I think the um, the flies that we just looked at and these wasps, they're this sort of inter incidental pollinators. They're not collecting pollen and moving it around. They're feeding. Yeah. And Let's move into the beetles. Yeah, the beetles the same way. They they. They're just feeding on the pollen there, but they move around from plant to plant, and that, that way they uh, can pollinate other plants. So a lot of the beetles plants. are looking for rotten fruit. Um, they're, they're getting nectar. They're not feeding on pollen. One of the things about the... Well, uh, they, they feed on a, pollen. A bit. But one of the things that you notice is that you've seen the ladybird beetle, you know, the little ladybug, which is a beetle, not a bug. And it... When it flies, it's got to lift that big outer wings. They're called elytra. And they have to look out. This is a very hard. You're looking at the elytra right there. That's shiny hard. It's a carbon or a um, carbohydrate. But they have to lift those up out of the way. And then the wings underneath, that's how they fly. And you've seen that in June bug, which are beetles, and other beetles. It just They don't just fly right off. They have to open up those that hard, hard shell of wing. So, a number of these are wood borers, but uh, the adults feed on on the, the flowers. But so far, with the uh, the flies, the wasps, the beetles, we're not seeing. Our, our foremost and our best and our most efficient pollinators, but they are pollinators and they're in your yard. You can see the pollen on the net wing beetle there. Gets it all over his face. He has an elong elongated face to get into the flowers. Uh, okay. Well, she seem to be stuck. I did. So get a good look at this. <laughs> um, yeah, we seem to be we seem to be frozen here. Did you try clicking on the screen? Okay, so the moths, um, you know, think moths, butterflies. What what are some things that we can look for in, in the moths, Elroy? Well, um, many, most of our moths, of course, feed at night, and we don't even see them if you don't go out there and, and look for them or set up a light system to catch them like some people do. But anyway, there's there's a few day flyers and they and they feed on on the different flowers that we have going on all summer. So primarily looking for nectar. Yeah, and they're identified by their an easy way to identify most of your moths is their their antenna. They don't have that knob at the end like a butterfly does. So that's a dead giveaway that they're a moth and not a a butterfly. And oftentimes the antennae of the moth is sort of feather-like. Yes. Oftentimes they hold their wings flat.
So as far as pollinators go, yeah, that's a tiger moth. Not bad, but still not our most efficient pollinators. But you'll see a lot of them at night in the the, the sphinx moths in the chamisa, or mm -hmm. in a feeding on the on the not chamisa so much. Uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, the datura. Oh, the datura. Yeah. Yeah. They they've got they get in there. It's kind of interesting to watch them. Okay. This is an excellent series. Yeah. Same moth. Three shots. Look carefully. So camouflage. Yeah. Don't eat me. And then a close-up of the scales. Yeah. So what I was saying earlier is that Elroy really has zeroed in on this biodiversity and looking at things that are all around us all the time, we just don't notice. That's American snout butterfly. That's a little one that we see pretty much every year and all. Fall is more prevalent than the rest of the year around here, but uh, other parts of the state, I've seen them uh, middle of the summer in great numbers. So Notice on the end of the antennae here, the little bulbs that separate that. It's very different from the moth antennae. That's a checkered skipper. Yeah, the skippers, yeah. the end of their antennae, are usually kind of bent over a bit. So they're still knobs, but they're just kind of bent over. Checkered light. And... and our number of insects are way down. And there's a good example, the, the common buckeye here in this couple pictures. Uh, is, I haven't seen any this year. In the past year, they were, I never saw one, and usually we see quite a few of them. So this is another skipper. All of the photographs that you're seeing here are on native plants, and um, the skipper, for example. Um, great size range from the, the double wing swallowtail, which a little we'll border see patch, it. Cute one. Yeah, yeah, and the, uh, the skippers, which are pretty small. Yeah. And the hair streaks. They're a real small butterfly also. And the Gulf fritillary, don't see very those very often, but checker spot. Marine blue. There's a number of small blue butterflies. Usually hold their wings closed so you don't see the blue, but there's a that's what marine blue looks like on the, if you're lucky enough to catch them when their wings are open. So all of these species that we're looking at, whether the flies or moths or wasps or butterflies, they are all tuned in to these native plants that they have evolved with, you know, for thousands, millions of years. And it, so it's vitally important that if we want to, maintain biodiversity that we plant native plants. Yes, you'll see these insects on non-native plants, but those non-native plants do not have the same relationship. They do not have the same amount of a benefit for these natives, and we are losing our natives, plants and insects. Western lady and the painted ladies many times are confused. There's the queen butterfly, also feeds on milkweed like the monarch, which you saw a little earlier in the show. And uh, there's a question mark butterfly. It doesn't mean he doesn't know what it is. It is a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's its common name. Yeah, common names. Another skipper. Look how those, the end of antennae, they're bent over. 
That's, you know, if you have binoculars, you can, binoculars are great for identifying and looking at butterflies from a distance and you can see that little bent nature. More skippers. On Lupin. Yes? Uh, Maybe pencil. So there's... Is this the uh, the two-tailed swallowtail? Uh, yes, those are two tails, right? And then we got some western tiger swallowtails coming up here too. And there's a fritillary. Fritillary. That Frit wing pattern. That fritillary. They all have this yep, variegated fritillary. And there is a chrysalis of one of those getting ready to emerge as and a I, butterfly. I believe that was on Jim and Jackie Blurton's yes. um, garage. Garage. <laughs> garage. West Coast lady there. And that's a Western uh, tiger, no, Western pygmy blue. That's the smallest butterfly we have in North America, and this is the uh, Western tiger swallowtails. A couple pictures of those. See, it's on the red columbine. Yep. This was up on Signal Peak. Signal Peak yeah. So now we're going to move <coughs> into the bees. The bees are our most important pollinators, hands down. They look at their hairy legs. They have these these pollen baskets on their hind legs and really their whole body the fuzzier the bee the more pollen it can hold but not all bees are are you know have that ability to collect a lot of pollen but they are utilizing that pollen they are they are consciously looking for pollen collecting pollen and taking that pollen back to feed their young to feed themselves. And these are all solitary bees. Yeah, 70% of our bees are solitary. Well, I think it's more than that. Or maybe more. Yeah. But many of them, maybe it's 70% are ground nesters. That's probably yeah. what I'm thinking. So, you know, forget the honeybee. We're not seeing any honeybees there. They are not native. We are concerned here with these native bees that utilize our native plants and have a a very tight association with our native plants. There's some indication that honeybees, if there are if there are enough of them and enough um, folks with hives, can actually um, compete and outcompete with our native bees. And there's a a male bee of one of the species that uh, has those long antennas. Uh, Apidae is the genus, I believe, or the family of those bees. There's quite a few bees with those long antenna. And there's bumblebees. Uh, we have a few species of bumblebees around here. Uh, they're the other uh, community bee that we have that nests together. Mm -hmm. And that's the only one that I know of other than the honeybee that... Great social. Is social, social, yeah. Rest of them, many other bees will nest close to each other, but they don't have the same. Look at the pollen that the hind legs here yeah. are holding. Yeah. Another one, it looks like it has chaps, or as Elroy says, Shap. chaps. <laughs> Full of pollen. Back. And there's, there's a, a bee sealing up its, its nest. And there's a sleeping bee, but this one is a predatory bee and will feed on other bees. Um, so I asked Elroy how he knows that the bee is sleeping. Let's hold that thought a second. Okay. So this little bee, Diadesia, 
has a very specific relationship with the globe mallow. And that's just one example. Many, many of our insect species have this sort of one-to-one -one relationship with a native plant. Okay, what's happening here? Well, that's your honeybees down in the in the um, cactus blossom when the cactus blossom. Uh, how do you want to say that? They they clasp onto the bee if you can. Okay, and that's a bumblebee. And a lot of bees don't uh, go into the front of the flower. The no, they've learned that they can uh, get to the nectar by cutting a hole in the in the flower and sucking it out right there. That's a carpenter bee, and they're not noted for their, their pollen, but there's quite a bit of pollen on quite a few. Of them. That's a large bee. Yeah, that's a large bee. It's as big as a big bumblebee. Yeah, and uh, they nest in a, the old stems of yuccas and agaves. So here we've There's, got cactus flower, and it's really interesting with the cactus flowers, when a bee comes in, yeah. it stimulates the, the anthers, anthers of, the stamens anthers of the, uh, of, of the, the cactus flower, and the cactus flower anthers turn in on the bee. And oftentimes the bees are down in, and they're getting a, a good dusting. This is one of my favorites, this little blue-eyed. How, how well, long this, would that be? This this is a little bee. Yeah, that's a, that's a mason bee. This that's, is a mason bee on manzanita. Yeah, that's a real real small one, and it's yeah. early in the year. So many of these are only out for short periods of the season. They're not there all summer. Many species are very specific to certain plants. Now, uh, I'm probably not getting a lot of bees because I shoot so many on the Gallardia, and if they don't feed on Gallardia, I don't always get their picture, don't always see them. But uh, anyway, that's sometimes the way it it's kind of hard to figure out what bee it is because they have so much pollen on them. Yes, but we have some other good pollinators, not as good as bees. What do we have here, Elroy? Well, we have a rufous hummingbird working on the desert willow. Chilopsis, yeah. Yep. And this is the calliope hummingbird. They're our uh, small one. That's the smallest one that comes through here. And they're always interesting to see. And this is a black chin. And that, that beautiful throat yeah. is called a gorget. Yep. And there's a couple of... What did you name this slide? Uh, save some for me. <laughs> Look at and that beautiful throat, that gorget. Yeah, and that's a broad tail. And then we have a bat that showed up here about 10 years ago that migrates up from, from Mexico. And it feeds on agaves and yuccas. And uh, anyway, so they're, they're new to the area, but the global warming is bringing them up here. And because of the fact that uh, their food source in Mexico it goes down too. So we have two species of agave, the uh, palmers. palmers on the left and the berries on the right. And right. this is the lesser long-nosed yeah. bat. Correct. That's, yep. So these host plants, this is the idea that, that there are these plants that specifically, you know, butterflies and the, the moths really gravitate to. The oaks are one of the, our best host plants. Plant an oak, best time to do that 15 years ago. Next best time, tomorrow morning. This is emery oak. They are fantastic. Cottonwoods with a you can see, leaf cutter You can bees. see the leaf cutter took the two. Yeah, they, they line their nest. What about that. the uh, juniper? Oh, yeah, the junipers, they're really important. And a lot of the small butterflies and moths, uh, you never see the larva, but they're on those and you have to, they look so much like the like the plant that it's very difficult to find. The leaves on there are small and so are the larva. So. The uh, willow, Salix, is a, another very, very important host plant. Lots of species of, of uh, butterflies and moths utilize those plants. This is our little... Um, Roost trilobata. Uh, Roost trilobata, <laughs> yeah. Okay, leaves. Many of these 
insects, moths, for example, they're not making these nice pupae and chrysalises that you think of. They drop right off the tree, right into those leaves. And that's where they develop. Not like the beautiful monarch we're going to see, chrysalis we're going to see in a little bit. Leave the leaves. It's extremely important for these insects. Leave the leaves. Until spring, yeah. Until spring. Yeah, until. Now, grasses. You know, we're going to ask Margie Gibson a little later about grasses. And the grasses are extremely important as host plants, especially seemingly for these beautiful little skipper butterflies. Grasses are flowering plants. You wouldn't yeah. always know that, but uh, we're going to see some spectacular photos to show you that they are flowering plants, but you've got to get your hand lens out. You've got to get in there and take a good look. These are the anthers yep. hanging down. This is my favorite, my favorite. The Indian rice grass. Yep. Little blue stem? A little blue stem is a nice one to have around because it colors up all winter. It has a nice color. Yeah, and they're bunch grasses, yeah. so that they're really good right. for erosion control. Elroy's favorite grass. Yeah, New Mexico feather grass. Blooms early. Uh, seeds, seeds are put out in about the 1st of June. And you can they see the end of the seeds, and then they're little augers that they just kind of work their way down into the soil. Richard Felger's most desired grass. Giant sacaton. Giant sacaton. Yeah. Side oats grandma here. So here you're seeing the anthers yeah. with this, the pollen in red and the uh, the stigma with a little feathery. You yeah. can see the same thing here. Mm -hmm. the, the stigmas are in orange and the anthers are dark. Um, so one of the moths that... Uh, the, the yucca moth. This is the, the state flower of New Mexico, yucca ilata. And it's just yucca. Yucca, because, okay. Uh, because different parts of the state okay. don't have ilata. In any event, there is a very specific relationship with yucca and the yucca moth. Right. They lay their, their young, the, the larvae feed on the, in the seed pods. So the pollination of the yucca is extremely important. Um, this moths, yeah, penstemons, yeah. yeah, a lot of butterflies like those. It's another penstemon. Rocky Mountain bee plant. Rocky Mountain bee plant. That's a wonderful pollinator. Yeah, native pollinator. Yeah. Let's take a look at the caterpillars. Yeah, a few caterpillars that are. The eggs were laid on these host plants, yeah. and they are utilizing. Yeah, this is a black swallowtail, and it has just shed, and it was feeding on the on the skin that it just had. Uh, this old exoskeleton it just mm -hmm. uh, shed. So think about this. These are in your backyard. Yeah, and the birds need these too. This is actually a fly? Uh, yes, that's, well, it's a wasp. Wasp, actually. okay. Yeah, we call them, uh, yeah, we call them. Uh, you know the inchworm. Yeah. And they're a good camouflage plant. They'll stick their, out there and look like they're just a dead stick. And yeah. twig and the last two were same 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 career. individual. Yeah. And a lot of these are moths. Uh caterpillars, the woolly bears, that type of thing. And of course the well, hornworms. There's quite a number of those, including of course the tomato hornworm that everybody's so familiar with. And then the IO moth, which is Probably not too many things feed on that one because of all those spines on her and are toxic. And uh, then there's some other large moths. This this is a larva is about 
well, he's about four or five inches long. And they start out many times in different colors. And this particular hornworm here, this larva was, I took that picture in the morning and I took this picture in the afternoon. It had changed color and it's getting ready to, to uh, pupate. So same individual. Not, yeah. Yep. Form of crystal. And uh, this is a grape skeletonizer. <laughs> Who's this friend? Oh, that's a, our black swallowtail again. And uh, oh, come on. So it's a challenge to remember what all these yeah these caterpillars I, are. So. Well, and I'm. As I get older, it's harder to remember things as quickly as I could before. That's right. And when you have the screen set to change pictures every, every seven seconds. Yeah. Don't have much time to think about One it. of the things about the, a lot of those hornworms are those are the beautiful sphinx moths that are as big as a hummingbird. And uh, just they've been a, they were just an absolute delight this summer. So if you see these leaves in your yard being chewed, you know that you've got some host plants. And it's a good thing. They're not going to take it all. That green one and this one are the same critter, just a lift, different instar. As they get older, they change colors. And so, and uh, saw flies, those are wasps. But anyway, they're quite common. Feed on a lot of different things. But look to me to be very, very tasty to young fledglings. Oh yeah, yep. And they're on a lot of pine trees. It's one of the things that we haven't mentioned is that an enormous amount of the energy that these young, these, these fledglings are getting is because their parents are out feeding on host plants, bringing back caterpillars of moths and butterflies. It is an extremely rich, rich source of nutrients. So host plants are extremely important. This, of course, is the, uh, the monarch chrysalis. Right. And then Don asked me for pictures of birds feeding their young, and many wanted pictures of caterpillars, and I don't have one. <laughs> he had not Everything. one photograph of a bird, a, an adult bird with a caterpillar. But anyway, it, they are extremely important. But they show a lot of different this insects is down there. Kind of feed me. <laughs> That was clip swallow. Yeah, and this is a, a curve bill with a grasshopper in its mouth. So, as I said, you know, you should kind of buckle your seat belts because it's a, uh, a whirlwind tour. And, you know, you don't need to, to name everything. So you, do. you don't need to no name everything, but my God. The diversity that we have here in the Gila region and all across the world is utterly amazing. And we can do a lot to help perpetuate that biodiversity. Luckily for us, Elroy Limmer is taking photographs and, and getting in. And, you know, some of these things that you were looking at are a quarter of an inch long. And you wouldn't know that by the photograph. So he's getting in there and getting that uh, sort of that vital essence of these uh, of these various uh, pollinators, and uh, so we thank him for that. I've I've put together a little um, sheet here of some resources, and we're going to get this up on our on our um, Gila Native Plant Society website very very soon, and. Um, there are so many stories that I could tell. Bat Conservation International, there's a problem with agaves. And if there's a problem with agaves, there's a problem with the bats that utilize them. And uh, it's tequila and it's mezcal. And it's in Mexico. And what Bat Conservation International wants to do is to plant more of the, the agaves agave perii, agave palmeri, 
and the Gila Native Plant Society and the Audubon Society are going to take a lead in planting um, these agaves for the bat for the preservation of the bats. The Homegrown National Park. I'm hoping Susan Campbell is here tonight. Um, Doug Ptolemy, you can go onto our Gila Native Plant Society website and look for past programs. Actually, uh, that was um, led by the uh, as part of the Gila Native, the Gila River, River Fest. Fest, and we were honored. The Gila Native Plant Society was honored to to host that that talk with Doug Ptolemy, and um, this idea that you know we're not getting a whole lot new national parks but if we each of us plant host plants plant native plants pollinator plants that in total we can really really maximize the amount of space for native plants national wildlife federation has a wonderful wonderful site a native plant finder that will tell you in your region these are the plants to, the native plants to plant. These are the butterflies and the moths that will come to those plants. Um, Russ Kleinman's vascular plants of the Gila or Gila flora is an absolute gem. Um, and it's on the Western New Mexico University's website. And the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation is one of my favorites because that science-based research and the, the protection of of this wonderful invertebrate um, biodiversity that we have. So that will be coming up um, on our website. So we are going to <laughs> open it up to some questions here. And let's see, I'm just going to go to the to the chat room and we'll start there. And uh, Okay, so we've we've been blessed and <laughs> been thanked. Um, where can the recording be viewed at a later time? So the recording will be on the Gila Native Plant Society website, which is HilaNPS.org. Gila, I don't know why I forget that. HilaNPS.org, and you can see all of our former. Um, many of our, especially, you know, obviously our Zoom presentations. And so it will be there. But please, please, please look for Doug Ptolemy's talk on um, nature's best hope. Um, and, and if you want to read some books, Doug Ptolemy's uh, Bringing Nature Home, 10, 12-year-old book that really, really spells out the need and that relationship between host plants, butterflies, moths, and the fledglings that are fed and nourished by those. It's, it's excellent. And I think most people realize our bird population is dropping off because our insect population is dropping, is disappearing also. Okay, so we have a photographer in the group. So Marty, um, give us tips on photographing insects. Do you focus on a flower and wait for the insect to land? No, just the opposite. I, and I, you know, people ask me that quite frequently and, and think it's difficult. And it is. It's not a simple thing to do. But uh, when you see insects, and then every once in a while, there's a, a cooperative one of the same species. There might be five or six of bees of the same species and pretty quick you'll see one that uh, he doesn't move as rapidly as the rest and I can get close to him and get a picture of him and so patience is a big thing of of photography and waiting for the action to happen and get close to him and by the way oh. that was Phil not not me that asked the question he's that's okay so Nancy <laughs> Stevens says awesome thank you she says, you mentioned that it's a good thing when insects chew plant and tree leaves. I know that's not what everybody wanted to hear. I'm sorry. But, you know, they won't take it all. I think she's quoting me. <laughs> Do you recommend doing anything to deter insects from fruit trees? Now, what we're talking about here are native plants. 
none of those fruit trees unless you've got oh you know some of the native mulberries or mulberries or something like that yeah. but but those are all non-natives um we are not um encouraging the use of of pesticides um so nancy what we'll do um it, it seems to me that on our website in landscaping with native plants, there's a section there that looks at alternatives to what many folks want to use. Um, physical barriers. Yeah, physical barriers, um, you know, simple spraying of non-toxic solutions. Um, anyway, so there, there, there's, a, there's a lot to be said about that, but it, it's a great question. A little chewing is okay, but yeah, tolerance to insects is. We've always been got to get rid of the insects. Mm -hmm. We just have to develop a little more tolerance towards insects. I think. Yeah, and you know we have fruit trees, and apricot and peach, and you know we're we lived in Minnesota for the last thirty years, so we don't. You know, we don't get those fruit trees, but here, you know, the birds would just come and decimate them. Well, very, very simple. Put some wildlife netting over them. They can't get them. You can see right through it. So it's not a, it's not a real eyesore. Um, so anyway, there are a lot of simple um, non-toxic um, remedies, pesticides, herbicides. These are very, very detrimental to our native insects. Um, so, but thank you, Nancy. So, so if, if, if you're really interested, and we hope you are, that was kind of the, the point of all of this um, in, in host plants and preserving this insect and, and bird biodiversity, um, Doug Ptolemy, uh, nature's Best Hope, um, Bringing Nature Home, The Nature of Oaks, and we'll put all of that up on our website very, very soon. Okay. So, okay, here's Susan. Um, if you live in town or suburbs, linking urban yards, linking urban yards to create native corridors. So it's just not you and then 20 houses and then somebody else. It's a whole series of linkage that makes these large corridors is the number one thing you can do and so easy. Go to Silver Creek Botanical Garden for some ideas and look at our website. Um, we're really proud of the work that we're doing and we um, are constantly trying to figure out how do we get the message out so that we can live up to our mission. A lot of people that, that thank Elroy, inspiring, take care of our backyard pollinators, never have seen so many photographic or photogenic insects. Isn't that great? Photogenic insects, see that's a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, do the birds get caught in the netting? No. We Sometimes if you don't have a good seal, or, or we have a, a small peach, so it's pretty easy to cover, and then we try to get that all the way down to the trunk and seal that off. The biggest problem is not getting stuck. It's getting underneath and then sort of being trapped. But... And yeah, and, and you also have to look for snakes and lizards, that, that netting, keep it up off of the ground because they get in there, you know, and they crawl through one hole and another, and then pretty soon they're in a knot, and that will kill them. So um, I think if uh, the snake lady is here tonight, she will thank us for that little piece. Uh, the... Uh, yeah, Melissa, um, advocates for snake preservation. 
Okay, so the website, once again, Wendy, is? HelaNPS.org. Yes, Hela NPS. So, Belitha, you got it right. We could make a calendar. Yes, we, <laughs> we could. And you know what? So, Catherine, we are always looking for volunteers. So you could help us make a calendar. So I, that, I always like to throw that back out. We, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, we, we really, really depend on our, our um, volunteers. Yeah, many years ago now, probably 10 years or so ago, that we uh, did a calendar. And maybe it's time to re revisit that and see if we can't come up with a new calendar for next year. If we get some volunteers to help. That's right. Yeah. And we'd probably get sponsors so that uh, it doesn't cost anything mm -hmm. to produce it. And then we make some real money off of it. So I see Anna's here. Must be her sweetheart, Jeff. Where did yellow jackets fit into the picture? Are they beneficial? Are they pollinators? Uh, to a minor extent, uh, they don't do as much. They're more. They feed on other insects more than anything, so they don't do much pollinating, and they're a pest. Yes. So why are they at our picnics? <laughs> well, it's usually at the. They're after protein. Okay. So that, that's what they like is protein. And yeah, and they do sting. Yeah, they're one of the worst ones. And yeah. I would assume that they're also looking for some carbohydrates because yeah. maybe yeah. they've landed on my beer or maybe yes, a, and, uh, a soda. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to be careful. You don't swallow those. I know someone that did that <laughs> and their, their throat swallowed or swelled up and the uh, they were in the emergency room. So I guess the short answer is they are they are pollinators, but not very not very good, efficient. Efficient pollinators. Yeah. They are little wasps, right? They're little wasps. They're yes. little wasps. And so, so they don't have all that hair yeah. like the bee does. Yeah. Um, and most wasps have stingers, but they don't uh, sting people very often. Yeah. They're very. You know, I don't get stung. And the yellow jackets do have nests. Yes. And then if you step Round on them, it's usually if you step on them, you walk on, it's the person behind you, which is yeah. sometimes maybe Wendy. So she gets hit five or six times. So, but, you know, we all live through yellow jackets. And uh, it's part of our biodiversity. And they're just. I didn't see one this year. They're just taking care of business. Yeah. And they're. Of course, I think it was so dry all winter and, and early summer that they didn't do very well. So Susan says that there have been times when they've needed to extricate uh, juvenile jay and western wood peewee from the netting. So I, I, I think that it's it has to do with, with sealing it well and keeping them from getting up from the bottom and no. then just being, and just recognizing and keeping an eye on it. Nothing is perfect, unfortunately. Good. Oh, Elroy, plug your book. I do have a book out of, during COVID, I was asked to send out pictures and uh, Peter Dorman volunteered to put a bunch of them on my folders together. And so I do have a book. If anybody's interested, you have to contact me. Uh, I'm not making any money on them, but anyway, they're, it's got a lot of insects. It's got a lot of everything in it. The uh, close-up stuff I do mostly. So, Catherine, we'll, we'll get that info up on the website, and we will certainly let you know how you can help. Okay, place. so as far as the, the field trip to Lake Roberts, southwest New Mexico, Audubon, and realize that the... Um, the Healing Native Plant Society and the Southwest New Mexico Audubon Society are, are doing more things together and jointly. Um, but um, we're going to meet at, um, at Western New Mexico University in the Fine Arts parking lot at 8 o'clock. And so we'll, we'll be there. And um, you can... Um, Where are you going to meet up there? Well, I'm not sure where we're going to meet at Lake Roberts yet. So, um, and there may be people that 
that want to meet us up there. So, so give us uh, give us a shout. Um, uh, website hela nps dot org hela hela nps dot org see hela nps dot org my mind is cluttered with many things hela native dot <laughs> org and um, we'll let you know um, kind of a, a a meeting place if you want to meet us at Lake Roberts okay. So let's see here. I'm, I'm I'm looking for more questions. Okay, we're going to go about five or six more minutes here. Maybe that was maybe that was the end of it. Um, um, Margie Gibson, are you still with us? I if am. You would, please. Okay, tell us about your thoughts about new thoughts and new thinking about pollinators and. Um, host plants? Well, I would direct everyone to a YouTube presentation by Stephen Carey, who's a butterfly expert for, on New Mexico butterflies that was done for the Taos Native Plant Society. And he says that, the new, that our grasses, our native grasses, are very important for butterflies and moths, especially grandma grasses. And they're beautiful, too. So add some to your yard. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, what's your feeling about pollinators these days? I like pollinators. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. But the thing that we have to remember is the life cycle of pollinators. So it's not just about nectar plants. We have to have plants that support the whole life cycle. And sometimes we need also need bare dirt for pollinators because they nest in the dirt. We, and as you said, we need to keep the leaves on the ground. Uh, we need to not prune plants until the spring because a lot of bees use the stems of plants uh, during the winter to, to hide in. So, and watch for information on pollinators on the kiosk in the botanical garden coming soon. Thank you, Margie. So it's um, we're we're almost to the, an hour. Um, Susan Campbell, if you're still with us, would you unmute and tell us about Homegrown National Park quickly and what we all can do? Oh, hi. Um, go to their website. It's a fantastically um, inspiring place. It, their map is so easy to use. You just sign up. You can, if you have more than one place to sign up, you can do that. And um, his idea, because he lives in the Midwest, is that if half of American lawns were put over to native plants, it would make a 22 million acre national park in our country, just in people's backyards. And so we can certainly do that here. We have the Gila, this giant beating heart of biodiversity right next to us. So we can just bring that right on into town by putting things right here that can create more safe space for everything. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, on behalf of Southwest New Mexico Audubon and the Gila Native Plant Society, and our good friend Elroy Limmer, I'd like to say thank you so much. Um, we had a lot of folks here tonight at one of our biggest uh, presentations. So that lets us know that people are interested. And this was, we, we put this program together and this was our first run at it. So we'll get better. Um, and But we hope to, to bring this this presentation to other groups in town and beyond, because um, it's 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 really important. Elroy, yeah, it's been fun, and uh, yeah, we're always willing to to work on this type of thing, and and uh, keep in touch with us. Come to the garden. That's right. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Good night. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very presentation. much.